the way I see this, these value functions, valuation functions, are, are never something we'll ever really observe. We, we can only observe people's behavior derived from those functions. So always remember that. Try to get rid of the value functions if you can. Right? Because ultimately, we care about the decisions we can observe and the things we can measure. Um, yeah, so what's the plan for today? We're going to talk about the last section again, the last session lecture we had. I'm going to introduce the continuous time model of search. And it's a very nice intuitive argument. The idea is to take a discrete period of time and let that time interval go to zero. And you, you see what's left over is actually the, um, the, what we call the, the uh, canonical reservation wage equation. Um, I'll give you some facts about the reservation wage, probably if I have time. And then I'll try to extend the model by adding job destruction. So in other words, the first model we did last time said that if you got the job offer that was sufficient to cover the reservation wage, you, you just accepted it and you got it forever. Okay, that's a really simplistic way of thinking about things. And the next obvious step would be to allow for people to lose their jobs with some probability using the same kind of setup as before. Okay, so let's... Uh, Last time we derived the reservation strategy for product market search. Okay, so we we had a, a very nice uh, discussion of how that that um, model was derived for. Um, it's probably still not recognize it. Um, then we flipped the model on its head and discussed uh, the reservation wage strategy for a worker trying to maximize expected income and receiving uh, periodic offers. Uh, wage offers, as we call them, from a constant time invariant distribution. And we derived the reservation wage for that particular strategy. And I'm going to review this now. I'm going to take you through that very, very quickly um, because many of you may have uh, not gotten all the details. I'm going to describe it first in words. So this is, this is why we do this course. You know, uh, I think it was Marshall who said you should, uh, or Pigou who said you should basically try to explain it in words first and then try to write down a model uh, that can at least capture what you've said in words, and if not, you should start from scratch. Okay, so in words, we're, um, we're looking at a worker that's trying to maximize her expected present value of, of income, and the idea is that workers supply wage, uh, labor inelastically, so every period you're just going to get this wage. So it's really easy to... to, to to, to figure out what the, the maximum is. And these are risk-neutral workers. There's no risk aversion in this model. OK, so if we have a, a discount factor of beta, then the rate, the implicit rate, would be just beta inverse minus 1. OK? And again, the choice set is very easy. You either take it or you leave it. And if you, if you reject it, you basically can't uh, call, you can't recall that uh, wage offer you got before. And in a station environment, that turns out to be consistent with optimal behavior. Okay, so I urge you, in case you haven't looked at this yet, to check out the article again, this one. You see a lot of what we do today is based on a couple of subsections of that, and they talk about that issue as well. The idea this is stationary search. So the person's being parachuted into the labor market, uh, sees the same problem every period, faces the same uh, probability distribution, um, and um, nothing changes by waiting or investing in time, uh, investing time in learning more about the search, um, about the opportunities that are available. Okay, so it's called stationary uh, search. Um, the idea of a reservation strategy uh, would imply that you um, have to compare two strategies. One is to reject, one is to accept. And having just rejected a wage offer, the question is what's the value um, of this project going forward. So if you reject this wage offer, you're going to get the, this income and unemployment B uh, during this period. And then at the end of that period, you're going to get another draw from a distribution. You'll have to repeat the thing again. So it's like Groundhog Day, um, you know, sort of, um, um, yeah, self-touch, murmultia, come to vita. So you have to, you have to decide again. Um, and that's what makes this interesting problem uh, tractable. In the stationary sense, the value of unemployment given the stationary distribution is, is always the same. Okay, so remember, capital F is the cumulative distribution function of this random wage that you're drawing, 
when you get your job offer, the, the wage offer distribution, and little f is the, um, is the uh, density function associated with that uh, cumulative distribution function. Okay, so we, last time we made the argument that uh, um, a reservation wage strategy is optimal. Okay, you can prove this rigorously. In the article, they go through a, a, a somewhat rigorous uh, discussion of that. Um, the idea is simply if the, if the value of employment is rising in the wage, if there are no dips, if it's a monotonically um, or weakly monotonically increasing function, then the wage strategy will be a reservation wage strategy. So you have a you have threshold, and once you get a, should you get a wage offer that's above that reservation wage, and you accept it, and that wage reservation wage is, is time invariant. Okay, and the way we solve for that, and we'll do that again several times today, is you're going to set, you're going to equate the value of being unemployed, the idea of having just rejected um, the last offer, and being able to take the income and unemployment B, and then having at the end of the period another chance to do this. You can always set the problem up a slightly differently, but it doesn't make any difference, especially when we let this interval go to zero. Um, the strategy that you will have to learn probably when you write the exam is to, figure, is to remember how to do this. Okay, so again, so yet it's basically accept or reject, compare the value of rejecting with the value of accepting, and then solving for the reservation wage. That's how you do it, okay? So we're, we're gonna do that um, at least three times today, if I get through. Okay, so you're comparing this, this value of unemployment with the value of having a job forever at W. So this, is a, this value of having a job forever is obviously gonna depend on the value of, the, of your draw, and um, there'll be some draws when the reservation wage is exceeded by the draw, and sometimes it's less than the draw, and that will determine the value of, um, of taking this job, okay? So we're gonna actually look for that kink, just like we did last time, the kink where W is exactly equal to WR, and then we're gonna solve for it. Okay, so that's the verbal explanation of what we're doing. Right, you're just looking for a threshold. It's a very interesting strategy. A lot of people have this, like, you know, what's the, uh, what's the reservation value of, of the quality of a movie I, I, I'm gonna watch before I get up and leave? Or you go to a you go to a show and it's you know it could be really lousy. Um, usually I'm pretty pretty tolerant. I'll take I'll watch anything. But uh, some people just their their time is too valuable, and they just get up and leave. So that would be kind of the reservation quality level. So you can apply this to lots of different things in life. Here we're talking just about you know going for a job interview, and it's 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 even less than a job interview. It's just a job offer in this model. We'll have we'll talk about offers and stuff like that later. Um, but right now it's just getting, you're getting a draw. So how do we do that mathematically? Um, we basically said, okay, if you take the W, you solve for the value of capital W, and that depends on little w, so it's a function. Okay, and we're gonna actually look at a, an equation in this function. When we decide indifference, um, and when we des decide what the value of unemployment is, it's gonna be the, the expectation over this value of having a job forever at different wages across that distribution. So the first thing you should be able to do when you solve this uh, is just to solve for big W in this particular case. It's really easy. Later on, it'll get more complicated. It's just the present discounted value of having um, little w forever, okay? And again, w spans, is, is, is drawn from this, uh, from this support from zero, so you could get <laughs> a practicum, uh, sort of a, an internship offer, or you can get the top of the distribution, the, the most, the most uh, high imaginable wage that's out there. Okay, so the unemployment strategy, if, if you reject and you wait for another offer, it's, it's literally a, an equation in this function W. It's because we take an integral over the value of the draw that I get in one period, and it's a random number, and I, even though I'm, risk averse, um, that, un, that, that probability is gonna have an effect on me, it's gonna have an effect on my uh, strategy. Okay, so the, the, the verbal idea was what is the value of rejecting that last offer and you're receiving the B and you get another draw. So you're gonna have to discount, you're gonna use the beta that we call, not the beta from Morton's and Pizzeridis, this is the, the, the discount factor, your relative valuation of future income streams, in particular, income stream in one period. Okay, so this is the complicated equation we wrote before. On the left-hand side is the unemployment 
the value of unemployment, the value of search unemployment, and it's the same for everybody in this model. Okay, you're, you're out there looking, you're about, to, you're about to draw, and everyone's the same, basically. So it's a, it's a constant in this model. Okay, so what do you get? You get B in that period, and you get the discounted value of this draw that you're taking in the next period. And that, ne that draw in the next period gives you the, an access to a new wage, but again, you're not going to take it if it's not sufficient. Okay, so you have this maximization problem inside the integral. So for every realization of W, you're going to compare the value of these two strategies, and you're just going to maximize by taking the, the strategy or you, uh, implementing the strategy, um, rejecting or accepting, such that you get the maximum value out of that for the realization that you observe. So that's why we have an integration over W prime. W prime is a dummy variable of integration. So DF of W prime is just the possible set of values, um, is, the, is the density evaluated at different values of W prime coming from zero to W upper bar. Okay, so everybody, any, have any questions about that? So the next step is really easy. We just compare those two strategies. Okay, it's just a, and I, I remind you that, that U, bar, U in this problem, capital U is, is really a, um, all workers in this problem are the same. They're all facing the same wage distribution. Now, of course, if, you're, if you've got a really great degree or had a great um, um, you know, a letter of recommendation, you might be coming from a different distribution than somebody else. But that's, that's not the issue here. Uh, we're, we're dealing with a very simple problem. Um, and basically, you want to find WR, and WR will just equate, it will make you indifferent. It, will, it equates the value of having a job at that pretty lousy wage. It's the least lousy uh, wage that you'll, we're willing to accept. That's the definition of the reservation wage. So there's not a whole lot in it for you if you take it. But anything worse than that, you would just reject. So the rest of the problem is just putting those two together and solving. That's what we did last time. Put them together, solve for WR. And I repeat this, WR doesn't have a closed form solution, but we can characterize it in a very efficient way. Okay, so it's, it's very rare in search models that you can actually write the reservation uh, decision threshold as a function of all the other stuff without re recursion on itself or recourse to itself. Um, and that's not a problem because we, we're looking at local results anyway. This is the result we had last time. Remember this? So on the left-hand side, we have the reservation wage. It's equal to the periodic income and unemployment, and then plus something. And that plus something is always positive. Okay? It's, it's always positive. It can be real small. It can be big. And that's going to depend on what's in there. It's going to depend on F that distribution, and it's also going to depend on your patience. What's your patience? What's the parameterization of patience in this model? Beta. Beta, right. So if, is beta patient if you're, is it equal to 1 or is it equal to 0? The closer it is to 1, the patient you are. Right. So if it gets close to 1, you're really patient. And you can see what's happening on that second term. As 1 minus beta gets really small, that term gets really large. Okay? And if you do this properly with, the, with an in, infinite upper bound, then you can actually speak reasonably about that limit. We can't really do it here because the old, the old search literature used to make upper, w upper bound infinite infinity. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to gloss over that, but in fact, it's the same logic. So don't, don't get too concerned about it. We'd have to define the upper bound for for a beta in this particular problem. Okay, but we'll just take small, we're taking small changes anyway. So this, this, this second term is positive. That means that WR is always gonna be bigger than B. Okay, so people are always gonna be a bit more choosy than uh, the level of unemployment benefits or help from mom and dad or, or money under the, under the pillow. Okay, that makes sense because that, that stuff on the right, on the second term is, the, um, is kind of the, the expected value of doing better than WR, because WR is the bottom of that range of integration, that bound, bound of integration, which kind of tells you that's why this is not a closed form. WR depends on something that's constant, that's B. It also depends on WR 
in the lower bound. So if you take a, if you do a, a comparative statics exercise, you're gonna have to differentiate that thing with respect to WR or take a total differential and solve for, you know, like DWR, DB, and you're gonna have to use Leibniz rule when you differentiate an integral with when one of the bounds contains uh, the thing with which you're dis differentiating, but it's not hard, okay? Um, we'll do it in detail later. Um, it's not a big deal, but that's, that's kind of where the, uh, the music is. So if you use mathematics to do this, it's a bit more, it's a bit more daunting maybe if you don't like uh, um, what we just did. But to move to the next stage, you use integration by parts. You, write, you get this formula that's going to be part of our life for the rest of the course. This is the, the way search um, theory likes to express this reservation wage. Instead of having um, the gap between w little w and wr for all the range, we're just going to take this, use this, um, this integration formula for the expected value. So it's the integral from wr to w upper bar of 1 minus the cumulative of um, the wage. Okay, so that, that's the formula. You, if you read the article, um, Rogerson et al. here, it's comes, it shows up every five, every, uh, five sentences, basically. It's a really important uh, notion. Okay, so that's, that's the equation we're going to come back to time and again. We're going to do it, we're going to derive it at least one, possibly two more times today. So I said already, this is not a closed form. So if, you, if someone pushes you and says, okay, uh, what's the effect of B on WR? You can't just say it's, it's one for one because B will have an effect on WR on the right-hand side. It will raise the, un, the lower bound of integration and that will have an effect on that integral. Okay, so locally you can use calculus to figure that out. Okay, it doesn't, it's not going to be extremely difficult to do, but it's just something to think about. You can also think about the effect of the upper bound of the, of the wage distribution. So what happens if that thing goes up? Or what would happen if you become more patient? We just talked about that. And finally, the most important thing that actually McCall, Mortensen, McCall, and even Stigler talked about was the spread of F. So the, think of the spread of, of the distribution holding the mean constant. What does that mean for the searcher, the searcher in the market? So using Using comparative statics, you can show the following. You can show that even though it looks kind of weird that you have the, the endogenous variable on the, on the right-hand side, it's true uh, that an increase in B raises the reservation wage. Okay, so that's kind of a no-brainer. Most people say it's common sense, but it's not trivial. Okay, I mean, you have to, in the theory, you have to show, you have to show it rigorously. So if I increase the unemployment benefit or the unemployment insurance rate, I'm going to increase people's choosiness. They're going to be a bit more selective. They're going to turn down some uh, wage offers they get in this simple model. Okay? An increase in the upper bound also increases the reservation wage. So if you have a chance of getting Bill Gates' uh, you know, um, salary or whatever, you're going to increase your own reservation wage, even if it's a very small probability. The third one says what we said already. Logically, the more patient you are, the higher the reservation wage will be, which again, by converse, making more people more impatient means they're going to be desperate. They're going to be willing to accept r less attractive jobs because they're impatient. They're not willing to wait another period or many periods uh, for that job. Okay, and finally, this is one that's very important. Um, the more spread the distribution is, the more likely it is that I will just by chance, even if I'm holding the mean constant, that I will encounter a really high value. I'm going to turn down the really low values anyway. That's the whole definition of a, of a reservation strategy. But the, the probability of hitting, a, hitting it rich increases. So my reservation wage will rise the more spread the distribution is. Okay. So this is going to already explain a lot of, of things in life, if you think about it explain why some actors are choosy. They don't take every particular act they can get or gig they can get because they, in their mind, they have lots of, there's a lot of, uh, think of the guys that play at these clubs, right? I mean, if you're, if you're good and you've already had a good track record, the chances are you'll get a really nice offer. You might get like 5,000 euros a night or something. Then you might be a bit more choosy and you won't accept the really cheapo offers. But if you, if you know you're not going to get those offers anyway, um, you're going to be a little bit less choosy. Yeah. Seven. So the intuition isn't it's the same. 
No, it's a di slightly different intuition because it's a second moment argument. It's the spread of the distribution. It's the spread of F. Yeah. And the first, three, uh, in the, the first three inequalities deal with parameters that are in the model. Yes. It's not quite the same thing. No, I mean you could, you could imagine an increase in upper bar and moving the, the mean of the distribution in the same direction, holding it constant. It's the spread. That, this point is the spread is what matters. So just you know holding the, the spread constant and the increase in the upper bound will also affect the cutoff point. So they're just two subtle different different arguments. Okay. Um, yeah. So to finish up. This is, um, this is something you see in, the, in politics a lot. So here are two formulas. You, know, you can use one or the other. They're both equally informative. But the second one is the one that we like to prefer um, for whatever reasons. But the first conclusion is that you'll always observe the reservation wage at least as big as B. OK, so it's like, a, like Guido Vestavella used to say this, you know, Arbeit muss sich lohnen. Okay, that's actually not always true. So we'll show it, we'll see it later. There's a search uh, model that actually allows you to invest in getting the job, getting your foot in the door, and then you could possibly have a, have a chance of doing even better. Okay, so, but that's a more complicated model. We're, we're trying to warm you up now. Uh, we'll get to that model in a couple of, couple of weeks, possibly even next week. Uh, actually, next week we have a holiday, don't we? Crazy, gotta love Germany. <laughs> Uh, so that's um, the second one we already talked about. So as, as people um, become impatient, their reservation wage gets really close to, to B. So if you're, it turns out that, you know, if, if you, for whatever reasons, if you're impatient, you're more likely to accept a job than if you're not. And this is all, this is all restricted to stationary search. It turns out later on next week or next, the next lecture I, I give, we'll talk about non-stationary search when actually the, the distribution is changing over time or the, the distribution of your income and unemployment might be changing over time. That's called non-stationary search, but that's really hard stuff. We're not going to do that. Uh, to, to the, to, we'll mostly deal with stationary search environments. Okay, so um, if, you know, this is, this is kind of a, a stretch because actually um, it's not completely right, but if, if we had a um, the tendency is basically as you let beta go to one, as people become more and more patient, you're going to come very close, if not hit the um, upper bound of the distribution. Okay, so that's a, those are kind of the important things you should remember. So now we're going to modify this. We're gonna, we, 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 let me just describe what we've done already. We've described an environment where you have an exactly one offer every period. So that's kind of unrealistic already, okay? Because a lot of times you'll apply for a job and nothing comes. So you might wait many periods. So how do you deal with that? That's a great question. So we're going to try to deal with that today. Uh, we, we know that um, you know, uh, the way we, we cook the model right now is that basically every time you, every period the page turns, you get another offer. We're not going to do that now. We're going to assume that arrivals are random. We're going to assume that basically job offers don't come um, every day on a silver platter, but you, sometimes you, you know, might, might even get more frequent arrivals. And I just want to make sure we've got the pin here. If I have to start using it. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> um, I'm going to assume now that arrivals are actually random, a random um, event. Okay, so there's no guarantee. So this makes it really difficult to do the discrete time problem, although we can. It makes it convenient to start thinking about a continuous time formulation where every sort of microsecond um, has some probability of something happening. Okay, so the one thing that might happen, you might get a, uh, a job offer, and then you might uh, take a decision, which means you accept or reject. And the combination of those two things mean you might be in unemployment longer or less, less for a less longer time than before. And uh, finally, today we'll even talk about random job, job disillusion. So you can continue, you can use this trick to, do, to deal with a bunch of uh, different levels of complexity in this model. 
So let's start by just assuming that whatever the unit interval is, so it could, you know, right now we just said it was one period. What's a period? Let's just say period has length delta minutes, okay, or, or weeks or days or whatever. And then we're gonna set up the problem using the, the delta as a unit of time, and then I'm gonna let delta go to zero. I'm gonna get delta smaller and smaller, and it's almost like magic. Um, a lot of this deltas will cancel out, and what's left over is basically a, what's called the continuous time. So even if delta were really small, even though you're not supposed to divide by zero, in effect, everything is shrinking at the same rate, and what's left over is basically a, is a, the same logic as before, except it's in continuous time. So you can think of a DT interval, a, like, like in calculus, small change in time, leading to a possibility of an arrival, but not necessarily, and um, that would give rise to the valuation problem that we just discussed. So it would help us define the reservation level of utility. Okay, in a different in a different setting. Okay, so we'll derive this in a second. But um, again, I'm going to do this in words just to make sure you understand what I'm doing. So we have this delta, and therefore um, everything is going to be defined on delta. So we can, if if we wait for delta minutes, then I can do a present value calculation of of getting paid something, one euro, in um, delta periods of time. If the interest rate per a uh, unit of time is equal to r, then I can just take one divided by one plus r delta. Okay? So that sounds uh, really radical. Um, I can also use that logic to think about arrivals. Okay, so the, again, um, think, of, think of arrivals as a probability. So in delta period uh, of time, in delta number of minutes, the probability of, of one arrival, okay, is equal, is, is equal to, to, to uh, alpha. And this is kind of what the Poisson assumption is. The Poisson assumption says that in a, in a discrete interval of time, the probability of, of observing something is, um, is, can be parameterized by a probability, but it also implies that the probability that that same event that happens twice in that period is very, very small. Okay, so I don't know if this is a little bit historical note for you guys, but um, one of the great statisticians of German um, uh, German sort of history of economic and uh, statistical thought is not Professor Hertler. <laughs> but it's, it's actually his predecessor. His name is Bortkiewicz. Okay, so uh, Bortkiewicz was a, he basically was commissioned or he was, he was asked by the king of Prussia's military staff to figure out what the probability was that um, their cavalry officers would get kicked by a horse. Okay, it turns out they had, the Germans always write down everything. They had great statistics on, on uh, horse fat fatalities due to horse kicks. So he was able to, to do some serious data crunching back in the 19th century. It was pretty interesting. So I think it was like in the early 19th century. This guy came up with something that we call the Poisson um, distribution, but Poisson got all the credit, French guy. It turned out that Bourkiewicz also... Um, I think Bordkiewicz is actually the late, the late 19th century. Um, in fact, I know he was. But uh, yeah, his, uh, his innovations uh, live on. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to take that as a, a working assumption. So again, you're going to have to, you're gonna have to bear, you know, you have to remember the probability of an event cannot exceed one. Okay, so we have to, we're thinking of very small uh, changes in... Um, Un intervals of time. So delta is, think of delta as uh, big enough such that the probability of, uh, that we're describing here, alpha times delta is not uh, greater than one. Okay, so then we're gonna set up the problem and then uh, let delta go to zero. So we're gonna make this interval of time really small and the problem is still well defined even though you're letting a lot of things go to zero. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's work that out. Okay. So this is the model in discrete time. All right, so the first, the first value equation we want to think about is, again, we're not letting people lose their jobs yet. So we're still talking about the value of having employment at, at wage W forever. 
Okay, so what would that be in a discrete world? Delta is the amount of minutes in the period, and little w is the wage. So how much are you getting paid in the first period? It should be w delta, right? Delta is the number of minutes in the unit period, and w is the wage per unit of time. So if so think of uh, W as the, the minute the minute by minute wage and delta is the number of minutes in the unit period. Plus what? And again, you get this, this job forever, you're not going to lose it. So you get basically the discounted value. And we're discounting now by the effective interest rate, which is R times delta plus one. And taking the inverse of that is the discount factor. Multiply that by the same value function or value of having the job in delta periods. Okay, so again, this is, don't confuse, I'm, I'm putting these little, little um, upper tips on the W so you can see that it's a capital W and the little W is the periodic wage. Okay, does everybody understand that? All right, so this is really easy to, to reorganize. So I'm just gonna do this very quickly. If you just multiply through left and right by one plus R delta, and then just, sub, just simplify it, okay? We can do that in, in, in detail if you want. So we get W, again, it's the same wage, okay? So the, the capital W is a function of little w, it's the same on both sides, so it's 1 plus r delta equals w delta plus w of little w. And I think I have to multiply this, excuse me, by 1 plus r delta plus Okay, so you see what's going to happen. Um, this one's going to cancel out with this one. And then I'm going to get W of W R delta equals W delta plus W R delta squared. Okay, so using arguments that we can imagine, Delta is still positive, it's not equal to zero. We'll never let it be zero, but we'll let it tend to zero. We can cancel, we can cancel one delta from each one of these. Okay? And then we let delta go to zero. And what do you get? Capital W of little w is equal to what? It's little w divided by little r. It's the annuitized value. Remember, you got the job forever. So this is a, you know, you should all be able to do this in your sleep. It's kind of the, the annuity value of having something forever. It's the, the console value. It's little w divided by the interest rate. Everybody with me? Okay, that's, I hope that's right. All right, so this is the, this is an easy one. That's easy to figure out. Because our objective is to figure out when you, when you have to do that max, every time you, pull, you put your hand in the, in the jar and you pull out a wage, you've got to compare it with the value of being unemployed. And if you pull out a really good wage, that's worth a lot. So cap W of little w is, is high. Remember, this is a function. So it's, it's, not, it's, only define, it's only going to take a value once you know what the wage is that you're getting forever. Okay? So that's an easy one. The harder one is unemployed. But unemployment is just like we did last time. The value of unemployment, right? So this is, the, this is the value of having a job. At wage W, and it's a function because you can, you know, you're lucky you get a really good one. If you did not, uh, if you get one less than your reservation wage in the end, you, you won't even bother to take it. And then we're gonna use that indifference uh, to solve. Okay, so the value of unemployment What's the value of unemployment? Who wants to give it a shot? It's going to be U on the right. 
on the left hand side, sorry. B delta, why? Because B is defined as a per unit time income, okay, just like W, okay, so it's going to be B delta, and then what? So what can happen to you? Well, first off, something's going to happen to you. You're going to have to make a decision in one period's time. So you're going to discount that back. So, so it's, it's a time. Oh, sorry, it went over our data. Yes. Exactly. So that's the discount factor. And the question is, what, 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 do you, what happens after that? Okay. Well, I'm going to I've told you that you don't necessarily get a job in Delta. So you're unemployed, you're waiting for Delta periods. The probability that you actually get an offer depends on Delta. Right? So what is that going to be? Yeah? Alpha times Delta. Okay. Alpha times Delta. Put a dot there. And that multiplies what? Then you get to have the magic choice. Once you get the incidence or the the arrival, we call it in, in, in search economics, okay? I get this integral from, it can come from anywhere to the upper, upper bound. And then I'm gonna have to make this terrible decision. I'm gonna have to ask what's better, okay? So in the interest of making this more legible, I'm gonna push this over here. Have some more space. So max of what? What am I comparing? Remember, it's just yes or no, accept or reject. If I reject, it's U. Okay, and U is independent of the wage that I draw because I can always go back into unemployment. If I reject, I, I'm back to where I was. It's the same U that we have on the left hand side. Okay, but what if I accept? If I accept, I get. I get the W, cap W that I just derived, okay? But it's defined at little w prime, and I'm integrating that thing over what? DF of W prime. Right? I'm, Remember, I don't know, I'm putting my hand into the urn, and I'm pulling out an offer, because I got the privilege with probability alpha, and now I get to see what it is, and I make this comparison. So I know what it was like to be unemployed, the model is stationary, uh, that's why I'm comparing this U on the left-hand side with this super opportunity I have on the right-hand side. Now to make this more legible, I'm going to, because you will get this eventually on the, on the website at some point, I'm going to try to Clean this up a little bit. One more time. D F W prime. Okay, so that's the cleaner version of this. Okay, so this already includes the, the possibility that I may lose out, even though, you know, I've decided to search. Sometimes you get unlucky. You know, you just, again, you might just not get anything. And that's happening with probability one minus delta times alpha. Okay? But in this search um, formulation that we have, we have here, all we care about basically is the gain, because I'm going to get you if I turn it down anyway. And if I don't get anything, I still get U. Okay, so those are the two equations we're going to compare. But now let's try to simplify this one. This is a little bit more involved, but it's the same kind of algebra that we had before. The idea is to how do I simplify and then maybe let delta go to zero? Because the, the, first, the first formula has been, was very nice. Okay, we managed to cook that down to a very simple annuity formula. Okay. So let's simplify first by multiplying left and right by 1 plus r delta. So we have 1 plus r. Sorry? Yes? What is about the probability that we don't receive an offer? This then you're still getting u. You're, 
you don't get to maximize because yeah. nothing happens. Still, so think of this. Think of the Morton's and Pizzarini's model. This is like that capital gain on what you had if you were, um, you know, if you were already working and something could happen. It could be better. It could be worse. You could job could be destroyed. It's the same idea. Okay, so multiply both sides by one plus r delta. We get u. Sorry. No, because you, if, you, if, you get allow, if you don't get anything, you're still unemployed. It's the only option for you. You're still unemployed. You still get you. Think of this second term as being kind of the, the capital gain that you could get if you're lucky. But it requires two things. First, you have to get a job offer. And secondly, you have to accept it. Those, those have to happen at the same time. Okay. But I'm going to... This is going to turn into a very simple formula in a second. I'm going to multiply both sides by 1 plus r delta, and I get b delta 1 plus r delta plus alpha delta integral from 0 to the upper bound of the max. Um, Actually, you're right. You're right. If you read the, <laughs> I have it in my notes. I just forgot to write it down. <laughs> okay. So there's a there's a plus here. Um, the complementary state, one one plus r delta, and then you just get um, one minus alpha delta times u. So we, we let delta go to zero, we will get the result I said, but you're not going to get it by assuming it. You have to prove it, okay? So this is, there's a discrete probability, one minus alpha delta, that you don't get anything, and then you get u. Okay, that's what I was trying to refer to before. So there you go. So now you can see if you multiply this, multiply through by one plus r delta, then you have to deal with this, which is exactly what we want. Um, so we have max of u and w of w prime taken over the distribution of possible wages plus 1 minus alpha delta times u. Okay, now so if I multiply this out, you'll see that u appears here, and it's going to appear here. It's going to cancel. That's wonderful. Okay, so that's going to help us. I'll, write, I'll, do, I'll take it out into detail, but you should do it on your own. Okay, so u plus r delta u equals b delta plus br delta squared plus alpha delta integral as before. Okay. And I'm going to multiply this out. So we have plus u minus alpha delta u. Okay, so these u's cancel immediately. And then we have every term in this equation has delta in it. So as long as delta is non-zero, we can divide by it, and we can eliminate that. So that's a nice little stepping stone. So we have ru equals b plus br delta plus alpha integral max u w w prime df w prime plus alpha u. It should be minus. Minus alpha u. Okay? Now watch this. This is important. So we're going to we're going we're gonna to realize this is a constant. If I take the constant of integration, it's got the same coefficient alpha on both, on both of those terms. So we can write this as the integral. It's alpha times the integral of 1 of 0 to w upper bound of max 
zero w evaluated at w prime minus u df w prime. So this is the net gain I was talking about before. This is what this is the most important part of the derivation is is writing this um, capital gain, okay? And we still have R U equals B plus R B R delta. Now look, delta only appears here. It's that second order term, and if we let delta go to zero, that term disappears. Okay. So let delta go to zero. And then we have, as a result, we get this RU equals B plus alpha integral zero to W upper bar of max zero. And uh, it's, got a, it's got a nice intuition. It just basically says, okay, I'm going to get a, a, in the next DT, I'm going to get an offer with probability alpha. And if I don't like it, I just ignore it. I ignore it because it didn't meet my standards. It didn't meet you. I'm already, I'm getting you. So why should I, why should I accept a job in this model that pays less than that? Okay. I'll put two extra parentheses around there just to make it easier to understand. Okay. So that's the continuous time version of the, the value of being unemployed. We haven't solved for the reservation wage yet, but we're going to do that in a second. It's very nice, nice, nice formula. But any questions about this? I'm going to put a box around it because it's really important. Um, We are, and look, we already have this one up here. Remember how we characterized uh, the optimal policy in these problems? We said it's basically uh, a reservation wage and a value function. Okay, so we're going to have to solve for that value function, the value of unemployment, basically. But we've already solved. We've already solved for the value of having a job forever. We said that's pretty easy. Here it is. So we're going to need that because that's exactly what's in our integral. So you can plug it in, right? Again, this is an easy problem. You know, you get, you know if you get a job, you've, you've hit the jackpot. You get W forever. It's like an annuity, okay? Console. So all we have to do is plug that into the, into the, unemployed, the value of unemployed, and we can solve for the reservation wage. Okay, so why don't we do that? But what do we need to do first? before we do anything else, how do we get the reservation wage? So this is a good question for you guys. What's the next step? Remember, the whole reservation strategy is about indifference. To get that threshold, you need the monotonic condition and you also need to compare accept, reject at that marginal value. So, Toby, Tobias? Um, so, at the reservation wage, we are indifferent between the value of unemployment and the value of the job. Okay, so U equals big W of little wr. That's the indifference condition. So, no matter what reservation wage problem you're looking at or solving, that's the essential condition to look at. At what value of W, little w, will this equation hold, and that's WR. That defines the reservation wage, okay? Now look, we already know what W, cap W is. It's really easy. It's just little WR divided by R, the annuitized value where little r is the instantaneous interest rate, okay? So that means that W of R minus W of little wr, where cap, little capital, <laughs> little r stands for reservation, okay, means we can, we can evaluate that thing. What is it? What's that going to be? I mean, this is a really easy problem. It gets harder when we <laughs> move on the class. 
And if you read this article, you'll see that it gets really hard. We're not going to do all the, the problems, but um, right? We can evaluate that. We know, we know it already. So what is it going to be? Somebody just blurt it out. And we, just, we, just, we just said what this is. And what's this one? And then just subtract them. So it's W minus W R. I keep forgetting whether it's a subscript or a superscript. It's a subscript divided by little r. OK? So because we just established that the, the reservation level of utility uh, in search is equal to the value of having a job at the reservation, that's equal to u. So now we have an expression for w. Big W of little w minus w at wr. And that's just the same thing as, as this expression above. You follow? You guys follow? We can substitute now. OK? So let's do that. Of course, it's going to get better as we move along, because the more we move along, the more interesting these problems become. We're going to have probability of job loss. We're going to have probability of getting a raise, probability of getting fired. You know, maybe your productivity changes on the job. All these things can be based on this simple, simple logic that we're developing and reinforcing today. So we get, um, what are we going to get? We're going to get R U. OK, but RU is equal to R times little w r divided by R. So that's equal to W of R. Right? The R's cancel out. That's on the left-hand side. Just make sure you understand what I've done. I've taken this equation and I've plugged in for big W function of little w at the reservation level. So it's the reservation wage. Okay, that's the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, I have the same as before. I have B plus alpha times the integral from 0 to the upper bound of the wage distribution. And now I've got this max in here, but I had, what did I have? I had 0, and I had, uh, I can write it out for you if you want. Why don't we do that? It was W of little w prime minus u integrated over the entire density. OK? But we already just figured out what that thing is. It's also the same, using the same logic, it's going to be little w prime divided by r minus little w r divided by r. Remember, u is equal to the utility you get or the, the value of accepting a job just at your reservation wage. So we can actually insert those, and we get rid of all the value functions. All the, the state valuations disappear. That's also a, an interesting principle in general. I just want to tell you, the way I see this, these value functions, valuation functions, are, are never something we'll ever really observe. We, we can only observe people's behavior derived from those functions. So always remember that. Try to get rid of the value functions if you can. Right? Because ultimately, we care about the decisions we can observe and the things we can measure. And in this problem, basically, we've got, if you can ask a person their reservation wage and they tell you the truth, then you're, you're much closer to, the, to, to learning about the economics of job search than, than you would if you just had some you know, some vague notion of a value function that a person may not even understand what you're, what you're talking about. So we can substitute that. So we get, on the left-hand side, we've already simplified this. I won't write it again. We have WR on the left-hand side. We've got B plus alpha integral 0 to W upper bound max 0 
W prime minus WR divided by R DF of W prime. Okay, so we're almost done. Questions we can, we, R's a constant, so we can factor it out of the integral, right? So we'll do that, plus alpha divided by R, because if you maximize zero or something divided by R, it's the same thing as maximizing a zero and the something that you were dividing R into, okay, logically. So that's the same thing as zero to w bar of max zero w prime minus w r without the r. Df of w prime. Now you can leave it like that. You could leave it like that. But we know that if we integrate, this is an increasing function, this, um, you know, the reservation property says you're gonna always reject below WR, so you can rewrite this integral using the reservation wage as one of the bounds of integration. Because obviously if the wage is less than WR, then max, that max operator is gonna always pick zero, right? So you're always gonna get zero, so let's just set it equal to zero and take the integration from WR to W upper bar of W prime minus WR DF W prime. Okay, so completing the, the equation on the left-hand side, we have the reservation wage, the fallback position, if you like. And then you've got this interesting new term I think I wrote it down right. Okay, and we can use integration by parts to give us the counterpart of this. Okay, so I'll put this in a box. It's kind of important. So there's no delta in there anymore. There are no value functions in there. It's, it's, it's the same. It looks very similar to what we had before, except now we've got this alpha. And that's the probability of not getting any, of, of, of coming up with something at all in, 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 a, in dt. It's the Poisson parameter for the arrival rate. And in job search theory, that's a really important parameter because empirically, people don't always, they're not just flooded with job offers. It depends on the, on the economic environment, like we saw in the Pissarides model. It depends on the ratio of vacancies to unemployment, et cetera, um, in, in the bathtub model. But this is even more uh, subtle. Uh, th this may have nothing to do with the ratio of vacancies and unemployment. This is just a general parameter of the model. So if we use integration by parts, uh, we can rewrite that or integrating by parts we get WR equals B plus alpha divided by R one minus F of W prime D F W prime. Wrong. D W prime. Okay, remember that's the when you integration by parts is when you. I'm sure Thomas has already done it. If he doesn't, hasn't yet, he will. Um, the U D V, the integral of U V D V is equal to U V minus V of the integral. The integral of V du, sorry. Okay, so verbally that never comes out right, so that's, <laughs> that's the, uh, the alternative way of writing it, okay? And you can, again, see that um, now we have a new parameter to play with. You can see already that if you let the, the rate of unemployment benefits go up, it's gonna push on the bound of integration at the bottom, but it goes in the right direction. It's gonna raise the, um, the reservation wage unambiguously. Okay, that's, that's always true. Um, you can also go back into, what's impatience in this model? It's R now, not beta, because we have a continuous time 
rate of time preference. So higher rates of R means more impatience. So the more impatient you are, ceteris paribus, uh, the lower your reservation wages. The more patient you are, the closer your, um, your value of R goes to zero. Now you can see, again, we have the same issue with, if you let, literally let R go to zero, you, you may explode the, you have a, a, a reservation wage that's higher than the upper bound of the distribution. That's not possible. That's why the, the purists would put infinity at the top Okay, but you can you can sort that out. There is a there is a a local relationship between your impatience and the uh, and the reservation wage, and it's negative. Or the more patient you are, the higher the reservation wage is. The more you're willing to hang out, and hang in there, and, and demand a higher uh, look for a higher wage. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, it's pretty straightforward now. Um, I took longer than I anticipated, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to take it easy in this course. The next part, I'm going to talk about some, some interesting attributes of the labor market. So we'll go back to my presentation, see if we can do that. And we'll come back if we have time, if I'm fast. OK, so we already found that out. So, you know, we, we, we've basically, folks, this, this past model we just did is not, the, is not the final version of this model you want to remember. We want to have people actually getting unemployed. So that's the next step. But before I get there, and because I only have like 20 minutes, I want to take you through some of the interesting concepts in this, in this model that we can already derive. Okay, so we have, we have, um, we can ask some questions about people in this model, okay? So how long will it take them um, to find a job? Okay, so what's the duration of unemployment in this model? Okay, we can figure that out. Um, we can also figure out what the hazard rate is. The hazard rate is, is the probability of getting uh, a job, okay, in the next very small increment of time. Okay, again, this is all based on time. So we have to, if we want to get anything at all, we're going to have to have some, expend some time. But think of a really small increment of time in unemployment. What's the probability that in that increment I'm going to get a job offer? It's called the hazard rate. And the hazard rate in this model is actually a constant. But in, in general models, it may depend on you, it may depend on your attributes, it may depend on how long you've been unemployed. So it's, it's, a, it's a much more general concept. But you should probably read in the in the... JEL article about this before we get um, um, to the more complicated versions. So you can think about the um, notion of a spell, how period of being unemployed without any interruption. And then you can think about what the probability is of exiting the unemployment rate, or unemployment state. And you can think of the, um, the expected time you're going to spend in unemployment. Okay, and the actual time you spend in unemployment. So this is, these are all interesting concepts that we can, we can uh, talk about. So we should do that, we should talk about it. Um, so how do I get out of this? Okay, so let's try to introduce some new concepts in the, in the time that remains. Okay, let's talk, whoops. <laughs> let's talk about the hazard rate. Okay, so think of the hazard rate as the Probability of leaving unemployment. So who wants to give it a shot? What is the most likely, what are the factors that this model predict already? This really very powerful, but still oversimplified version. There are two things we, um, again, this is a stationary model, so time is not a factor in this model. The hazard rate is constant because 
you know, if you're unlucky to be unemployed, at least you're lucky in the sense that being unemployed longer is not going to affect your probability of leaving unemployment in this model because you're always pulling from the same distribution. You can imagine that not being the case. Maybe the longer you're unemployed, the less favorable the distribution is that you're facing. Okay? So let's call that, let's call it H, probability of leaving unemployment. Okay, so what is that? Immediately we can decompose it into two components. The first one is the probability of an arrival. Okay, so the incidence of an arrival. And we call that, that was alpha. You can't get a job unless you have an arrival. Okay, but conditional on the arrival, it may not be enough to satisfy your, your tastes. You know, we, we have the, this, this is a very interesting way of thinking about the tastes of the unemployed. If they're choosy, that means that they think there's a good chance they'll get a better job offer or they have some income in unemployment that's helping them stay above water. So what is the probability of accepting the offer conditional on getting an offer? Think about what the reservation wage is about. Who wants to give it a shot? So it's a product of two probabilities. Okay, it's like a probability of having an arrival in DT. So the, exactly. So what is the probability that the wage you pull, given the arrival, is greater than the reservation wage? 1 minus FR. Perfect. So it's 1 minus F, F of WR. That's the hazard rate. It's constant. You have a constant hazard rate. All right. So that's a, um, we say that if the length of the spell um, is distributed exponentially that the that the the density of the of these spells is said to be poisson a poisson type of process okay the the distribution of time elapsed before you change so if you're unemployed you start on you're unemployed the clock starts ticking uh, the 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 distribution of the length of time that you will be in unemployment until you leave unemployment if that has an exponential distribution, then this is a Poisson process. This is kind of a characteristic of this constant exit probability uh, that we're looking at. Okay, so this is completely unrealistic if you go right to the labor labor data. But it's a good starting point because if if a person's reservation wage doesn't change, then the hazard rate still could change because alpha is changing. And we assumed alpha was constant, but you could also have a constant alpha, but people's reservation wages may be changing because they're getting desperate. Suppose you, suppose you lose your benefit after a year, then you're going you're gonna to start making concessions. As you get close to the exit period, the exit, the last period where you get benefit, then the probability of you accepting anything is going to be much higher than it would be before. So both of those things in a more realistic model could matter for the hazard rate. But in this model, they're constant. Okay, so we have the probability of, of arrival and the probability of acceptance. Okay, so the two factors that are kind of both important. So I'm gonna, we're gonna call this H, and I'm gonna show you that you can use this, um, you can use the fact that it's a Poisson type of process, the distribution of the of the spell that's completed is, um, if it's Poisson, you can actually take the expected value of it and find out what that is. Okay, it's a really simple answer. 
So this is a this is something that the, are, are there any macroeconomists here? So there's a in, in discrete time we have something like this: the probability, the Calvo probability of changing prices, the Calvo, the the, cal, the probability of not changing prices every period. You can think of the the expected duration of not changing your prices. It's the same idea, except we're going to do it in continuous time. So if the length of a spell is distributed exponentially with density. And this is all in the, in the Rogerson article, by the way, so you take a look at it. Um, and the density would be H, okay, times Euler's constant raised to some parameter, call it beta, and then t, where t is the, the value of the, the length of the, of the spell, then we are considering a Poisson. So it's the, uh, the Bordkiewicz type of process. OK? And we can check that h e to the minus h t. Did I put delta up there? A beta? That's wrong. It should be an h. This is an h. OK. Check that this is a, a density. How would you do that? Just to make sure. And remember, t is coming from 0 to infinity. Okay, so you can never have a negative spell, but a person could really have bad luck and be unemployed forever. Okay. <laughs> that would be the, but it's a very rare event. It's almost, it's going to happen with, with, with zero probability in the limit, but um, still you have to consider it. Very, very small probability, you could have a very, very long duration. So how would you check, how would you check that? What, what do we know about density functions? You have to in, they have to be? If you, if you integrate, right. So summing up means you integrate because we have a continuous uh, density function. So if you just integrate from 0 to infinity of h e minus h t dt, that thing, and I checked it, it actually does integrate. Um, you have to remind yourself how do you integrate an exponential function. And the cool thing is it's got the h here. Right, so that's the derivative of e to minus h t with a minus sign in front of it. Okay, so the integral of that thing is going to be minus e to the minus h t evaluated at the bounds 0 and infinity. And if you plug in t equals infinity for that, you get 0. And then minus at 0, that that expression is equal to minus 1. So minus minus 1 is equal to plus 1. So yes, it is a density. OK? Remember, density just means you add up all the probabilities. They add up to 1. And a continuous uh, uh, density function means you just have to integrate. OK? So what's the average duration? How would you do that? If we know that's a distribution function, the, the probability density would be uh, what we had here, that's the, the density. And if you wanted to find the average duration, how would you do that? It's like you do it in statistics, right? The expected value. And this is an interesting concept because it means I don't know this guy, but he's in this model and he becomes unemployed. What's the expected duration? How long is he going to be unemployed? So how would you guys do that? Thomas, tell him. Exactly. So the density times at every t, okay, the probability of observing t, and it's a continuous, um, it's a continuous function. So the expected value is equal to the integral from zero to infinity of t h e raised to the h t dt. 
Okay, that's the density and that's the value. That's how you do an expected value. Okay? That's the probability, that's the value, and we're letting t go from zero to infinity. Pardon the terrible handwriting. Okay, <laughs> still bad. That's the expected value. So we can evaluate that. It's fairly straightforward. But you have to use integration by parts. Okay, so again, this is something you might, if you like math, you might be, play with it. Um, but just make sure we understand, this is the duration of the spell. And this is the density of the distribution of the spell. Okay, so you can, you can take that using, the integration by parts is really quite beautiful. If you like, if you like even, this is kind of, most people who don't do, um, people who do serious math will think this is ri ridiculous that I'm, I'm even talking about it, but it's, I think it's kind of neat. So let V equal minus E to the minus HT, U equals T, and therefore DV is equal to H, E minus H, T, and D, U is equal to 1. Okay, so then we can just do the integration by parts, let it rip, and we get that integral is going to be equal to T times minus E to the minus H, T. And you're evaluating that at the bottom the top of the distribution, minus the integral from 0 to infinity of minus Euler's constant raised to the minus h t dt. Okay, again, this is, this is uv, and this is integral of v du. Okay, so this turns out there's a lot of zeros here. If you raise, if you, if you um, evaluate this expression at t equals infinity, um, the limit of that thing as t goes to infinity, the exponential function dominates. That's going to be 0, minus 0, minus 1 over h times e to the minus h t evaluated at 0 infinity. And that's just going to be equal to what? Well, if you if you take that upper bound, that's going to be 0. When you take the lower bound, that's going to be 1. So it's minus, minus 1 over h. And that's just equal to 1 over h. So this is a punktlandung. We're actually going to get <laughs> It's 1 over h. So the cool thing about this is that h is the... We define that as the, um, the overall incidence parameter, the, or the overall Poisson parameter above, right? We called it h. So the, in this continuous time formulation, the x ante x expected value of a duration is just one over that parameter. OK, so it's, again, if, if, if this h is equal to 0.25, that means that in my model, the average duration is going to be four, four periods even though this is a continuous time problem. And the cool thing about this is it's also true if you do a discrete version of this. So you can do it with discrete time, and if you do the, the summation correctly, you still get the same answer. Okay, it's one over the, one over the incidence probability. So that's why in the, in the Calvo model, if, the, if the, um, the probability of a price change is equal to alpha, then the duration is one over one minus alpha. Okay, so it's just a, and then you can see that if, you know, if, if, if h goes to zero, very unlikely you're going to leave the state, so your average duration is very high. And if you're in a high turbulent labor market, you're getting lots of offers, lots of people accepting their reservation wage, that would imply an h very close to one. Um, sorry, a very, an h close to infinity would make your, the average duration of your uh, spell very, very small. Okay? Um, maybe for an exercise we can do the discrete time version. It's very easy. You just have to, I can, I can set it up for you. Um, 
This is really important because we do this all the time. We do this in other fields. We don't just do it in labor economics, but we also do it. So think of the discrete time analog. Okay, so remember discrete time, guys. Discrete time. Discrete time is like t equals one, t equals two, t equals three. So I'm gonna I'm going back into the past and doing the discrete time version just to make make it clear to you. Okay, so t is equal to zero, one, two, dot dot dot. Okay, I'm going to show you that it still works. So suppose the probability of exiting unemployment is equal to phi, or as the Americans say, phi. Okay, and that's just going to be equal to alpha times 1 minus f of the reservation wage being um, exceeded by the draw. Okay. So I'm just going to work with phi. So the question is, what is the expected duration of unemployment? So a guys about to become unemployed, and you want to know how long it's going to last. So we can just write it out. So duration, one period, it has to last at least one period. Okay, two periods, three periods, four periods, dot, dot, dot. Spell duration. Probability. What's the probability of expending exactly one period in unemployment? It's the probability of getting an acceptable offer and taking it, okay? What's the probability of spending exactly two periods in unemployment? It's going to be one minus phi. That's the probability of the first period being a dud, and the second period you take it, times phi. OK, what's the probability of spending exactly three periods in unemployment? It's the same logic. It's a problem of striking out for the first two periods. That's one minus phi times one minus phi. That's one minus phi squared times phi et cetera, et cetera. So the expected value, how would you figure out the expected value? It'd just be the weighted sum of all those outcomes weighting by the probabilities. Right? Just like we did before, taking that integral is the same thing. You said, it, you said summing the outcomes times the probabilities is the same idea. So that's going to be the sum from 0 from i is the, is the expected duration. It, can only, it has to be at least one. If you become unemployed, you have to spend at least one period in unemployment, going to infinity, of i times 1 minus phi to the minus 1 times phi. No, that's right. Exactly. This should be an I. Okay, so it's just, again, factoring out the phi. And obviously, the, the longer the spell is, the less likely it's going to be. But it, again, it takes longer. So that's the, this is the expected value. Now, we can, we can use a couple of tricks to evaluate that. Um, I don't want to spend too much time. You, you have to. We're, kind of over time already, but I'll show you the, the, the idea. Um, I'm going to write this as the sum from i equals 0 to infinity of, I'm going to factor out phi, OK? And then I'm going to have i times 1 minus phi to the i. The trick is to write this thing as the derivative with respect to phi of something. And that something is 1 minus phi raised to the i. So I'm still, remember, I don't know if you remember this, but the differentiation operator is a linear operator. So we can literally factor out 
um, you can in fact you can literally write this object as this one, but you have to put a minus sign because the derivative of this thing has a minus sign. So you're going to have a minus, and that's going to be um, the equivalent expression. So you, you write this thing as this, recognizing that this object is the derivative with respect to to phi of of this object. Okay, you can check to make sure that's the case. And then you can rewrite that um, as minus phi. And because the differentiation operator is also linear, it's equal to the summation from 0 to infinity of 1 minus phi to the i. And this thing we can evaluate using the a geometric um, series. That's ex exactly what that is. But then again, we, afterwards, we have to differentiate it. So we can, and this is for, for all phi less than or equal to 1 and greater than 0. So it has to lie in that interval. So we can rewrite that as 1 minus, 1 minus phi times the sum from i equals 1 to infinity of 1 minus phi to the ith power. I mean, I, I'm only torturing you because it's really a, a great example. I mean, the answer is going to be very, very, it's going to be identical to what we had before. So now we have to, to recall that this thing is equal to the in the geometric uh, series formula, it's going to be 1 over 1 minus 1 minus phi. And you got one minus phi here, and you still got to take the derivative. Okay, so now we can we can simplify this thing. This this thing simplifies because this is equal to one minus phi divided by phi. And now we just have to evaluate this. Sorry, it's so messy. So who wants to give it a shot? Quotient rule or product rule. It's a product of 1 minus phi and 1 over phi. OK? So it's going to be minus phi times whatever that is inside. And that's going to be minus 1 over phi. That's the. That's the derivative of 1 minus phi um, times the numerator, which is 1 over phi, minus the derivative of 1 over phi holding 1 over phi, 1 minus phi constant. And that's going to be um, phi squared inverse, OK? 1 over phi squared. And you can simplify this. And believe it or not, I didn't believe it the first time I did it. Phi minus phi times minus 1 over phi is equal to 1. And minus phi times um, 1 minus phi divided by phi squared is going to be 1 is going to be 1 minus phi divided by phi. OK? And then what happens if we try to simplify this guy? Well, that better be right. Otherwise, I've wasted your time. <laughs> so that's um, phi over phi divide plus 1 minus phi over phi is equal to what? 1 over phi, QED. 1 over phi, just like 1 over h before in the continuous time version. So this is a really robust uh, idea. If you know the probability of, of, of a transition, then you can calculate the expected value of the length of time in the transition by just taking the inverse. OK, so next time, I'm going to give you some facts about Germany. Um, did you know that in an average year, in the period 1991 to 2000, 73% of all workers did not change jobs? It's a pretty amazing fact. In an average year. You might say, well, that's quite a bit of turbulence for some people, because 
but the fact that it's very stable, even though unemployment was very high in the 1990s in Germany, there was a lot of stability. Okay, so on the other hand, 9.2% of all workers changed more than once during that year, an average year. So, so it kind of tells you maybe maybe it's not a it's not enough to have a single model. You're gonna have to think about heterogeneity in some deep way, and you're also gonna need to think about separation. So a lot of people lost their jobs. I mean, a small fraction of the total employment, but people did lose jobs. So the next part of this course will be to adopt a separation probability. So there'll be a lambda, which is the probability of losing your job. So remember, you, before you just got the job and you had it forever, now you have a probability of losing it. It doesn't change much. The new reservation wage incorporates that new probability of losing your job. It makes you a little bit, uh, it certainly affects your choosiness because if you if you're gonna lose a job, the job is not gonna be so valuable anymore. It's not like winning the jackpot. It's like winning the jackpot and then somebody steals it from you. All right, so that's kind of the, it's gonna affect your, your reservation wage, but we can understand that using the same model that we had before and using the same derivations, okay? So thanks for your patience. I look forward to seeing, hopefully, all of you. Hope, please come back. <laughs> Some empty chairs over there, it's sad. Um, anyway, so have a nice week. See you later.